food. Uh, we, we are ready. You're ready now? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is Lynn Oldwood, and I'm, I'm chair of the service committee, and we'll welcome all of you to the meeting with all the meetings in order. And um, do we have a quorum? Um, let's see. Yeah, I, I do a roll call. I can. All right, so Mr. Anderson, not here. Um, Mr. Huggins? Ms. Burgess? Yes. And Ms. Gleaton? Ms. Gleaton is trying to get on. I just talked to her. I don't, must be some problem. All right, well, we don't, we don't have a quorum without um, either Mr. Huggins or Ms. Gleaton. I mean, if one of them has to be on, but have a quorum.
Yes, uh, Mr. Burgess, um, uh, Paige is contacting Ms. Gleason. All right, thank you. Um, the next one is... Well, 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 I mean, really what I was asking was, do we have a time frame of oh, a future meeting? I didn't know have what you anticipated in terms of them being ready for that. Hoping September, but at the latest October. All right, September. The next one is the park and ride uh, plan. And that is part of the short range transit plan that our consultant team is working on. So uh, once that is done, um, there will be have uh, details on the park and ride lot plan. Um, the next one is the streetscape project for Hardin and Taylor Street. Uh, but we are working on permitting that project. And we hope to have that project uh, under construction in the next month or two. And for the for a reminder to the committee that is building a a super stop at the corner of Hardin and Taylor, uh, northbound Harding in front of Benedict College, and southbound Harding next to the subway. I mean, I've Madam Chair, yes, Mr. President. I'm looking through this. Why are we still having headers in here with trans dads on it? If you look okay, through your back. You, we move into the next, um, you move into the next agenda item. So are, are they, let, let me just hold you a minute. And then any further discussion on the open um, motions from the board, that report? Okay. So, 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 the, next, so the next item is the trans dev operation for safety. So, John, this is just the, the residual in June? So that is correct. Um, to answer Mr. Burgess's question, we're, we're always two months behind. And the reason why we're two months behind is the timing of when we receive the monthly report from the contractor by the time these committee meetings are held. The contractor is responsible to give us the monthly report by the 15th of the month. And generally, these committee meetings are before the 15th of the month. That causes us to be two months behind. So this will be the last TransDev report you'll see. And next month, you will get the July RATP Dev report. All right. So, so John, is there, um, is there really any unfinished business from TransDev that we need to pay attention to in this report? Or, or is this, can we just accept this as information? I would accept it as information unless you have any questions about TransDev's activities in June. All right. Do we, do we have any questions from the committee? Then I, I propose we just accept the transcript report, that final report, as information. All right. I'm second it. All right. I don't even think we need a motion, Ms. Wilson, but I'm glad to have you on the line. I finally got to second on it. <laughs> okay. Thanks. All right. So um, then we'll move on to the RATP Dev operations report. Yes, uh, Corey or Ben should be on the line to present this. Who do we have on the line? Corey, Ben, 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 Ben,
Um, so I can provide some comments regarding the content uh, included in your packets. Okay. Um, as you mentioned, we do have the local leadership team all secured with the exception of the information technology manager, the, a permanent one, but we are actively recruiting uh, to fill that uh, uh, position. Uh, throughout the transition process, um, RATP Dev brought uh, uh, a whole host of resources to the table in order to ensure a smooth transition. Um, myself and my colleague, uh, Rob Stevens, served as your transition managers. Um, since transitions are often uh, involve um, the transition of people first, so Karen Bass, our corporate human resources leader, was heavily engaged throughout the process. We also transitioned to assets. So we brought in a, a subject matter expert in the field of vehicles and uh, maintenance um, assets, Paul Howell, as well as Sean Donna to ensure all of the technology was transitioned. We have support from our corporate leadership along the way, including from our chief executive officer, Arnaud Legrand, uh, who was on site several times throughout, throughout the transition, as well as our other corporate leaders from throughout the United States. Um, the transition was um, generally, uh, it, it was launched the week of um, uh, like the last week of May, and from that time, uh, RETP Dev brought the, the, the resources that I outlined in for a smooth transition. We went through a four phase uh, transition uh, period. Um, it, it really started with, um, with the people, uh, so getting them transitioned over, uh, getting them onboarded. Um, as well as uh, doing a thorough review of the standard operating procedures and policies that govern the operations at the Comet. Um, we spent a lot of time um, uh, doing detailed training to make sure that we had the foundation uh, in place for a successful operation going forward. Um, we also uh, had a, had a um, strong communication with the team in order to ensure that the employees were uh, well taken care of, well informed, and set up for success. Um, we also brought on board a, a series of um, uh, vendors to help support the operation here at the Comet. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, we uh, spent quite a bit of time um, reviewing the assets, the transit vehicles, the facilities, and we uh, ensured that uh, we had all of the necessary equipment and tools in place in order to keep your transit system in a state of good repair. Um, safety and security of your transit system was, uh, was always job number one. Um, so we, we ensured that safety was top of mind throughout the transition process uh, going forward. Um, we, we, we have some open items, you, you know, that uh, we, we're still working with the, the Commandant. They're mostly behind the scenes related to plans, policies, and, and uh, uh, procedures, which we are currently drafting. Uh, but by and large, happy to report uh, that we have had uh, very successful operations as well as maintenance activities. And I'll hand it off to Corey in just a moment, and he can provide you an update on those, on those details. Um, RITP Dev takes excellence uh, uh, very, um, very importantly, so we always look at the quality of our work. Are we being as productive as possible, and are we providing top-notch service uh, to our clients? We work to continuously refine processes, um, look to eliminate waste, seek uh, best practices, and really enhance the work environment 
uh, to create a sustainable and successful operation. Um, and so going forward, uh, I just want to say on behalf of our leadership team, we, we sincerely appreciate the trust and responsibility that you, the board, has placed in RETP Dev to serve as your new transit service provider. Uh, we're, we're absolutely looking forward to, to a long and, and, and healthy and thriving relationship going forward throughout the terms of our contract and even beyond. Uh, I, I hope as your transition manager that the transition uh, was somewhat, you know, was, was virtually invisible to you and uh, was uh, seamless because uh, that was certainly our goal. Uh, with that, Mr. Ando, members of the board, thanks for your time and attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions regarding the transition. Thank you, Mr. Lama. Do we have any questions from um, committee members? I think we had um, Al Kuhn that jo joined us. Was anybody else who joined us on that? Okay. Any questions for, for Mr. Lama on the transition? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. I think you gave a good one, Ms. Lewis. Yep. That does sound good. And uh, we appreciate the attitude that he's, he's expressed in terms of, of working for success together. And so then we want to move on to Mr. Gagnon. You want to tell us about current operations, Mr. Gagnon? Sure, good morning. Uh, I, was, I hope everyone's doing well. I, I'm also having a terrible time of hearing uh, what, what uh, is being said. I believe that people are just asking for an overview of operations. Is that correct? Yes, yes. And any one, uh, one thing we so, usually look at is any kind of um, um, performance measures that you've been able to, to, to uh, cover so far. You know, once again, I, I definitely cannot hear anything that's being said. I'm so um, sorry, I because you're coming in very clearly. I don't know why uh, it's hard for you to hear us. Corey, are you still there, Corey? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm here. Okay. Can, can you hear Ms. Mood? No. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I, I can't tell you to go ahead if you can't hear me. Can't, it, are you listening on your computer? Yes. Okay. It might be best if you can't hear just to call into the line, but go ahead and can, just go ahead and give, give us an overview. Sure. So just, just as an overview, um, Really, it's an excellent system. Um, we are. In a good, the good news is really every every morning we make pull out. Um, every afternoon we meet peak. Um, uh, the on-site performance is always above uh, 90 percent. Uh, whether it's fixed, flex, or uh, parent transit services, um, the the drivers are generally happy. Uh, we just had a nice uh, Chick-fil-A piece the other day. For everyone seems super excited about that. Uh, we have another one planned uh, coming up in another couple of months, uh, along with your Thanksgiving dinners and such like that. But the, the overall health of the system, I, I would say, is, is excellent. Um, really happy with um, with all the operational things that we're seeing. Teams are getting done 100 percent. So I really, it's, it's just been a really good process. No accidents. No accidents, um, Corey. Uh, it was, I believe it was one accident, some of one of our mirrors, as I recall correctly. Um, other than that, I've got no, no major accidents, um, no trips, slips, or falls, um, nothing of the sort. Okay, and, and, and well, another one of the measures we have used to look here is any kind of um, repairs in the field or swap outs that you had to do. How have your road calls been? Uh, road calls? Uh, they've been uh, not, not heavy at all. Uh, uh, you're, you're, you're a couple of, uh, you know, standard type of things, uh, uh, airbag blowouts, um, cause the tow, that, that type of stuff, but nothing that has been a major, um, major indicator that there was poor service done on the vehicles at any point in time. Um, normal wear and tear items, you know, tire blowout, airbag goes, um, small, small things that do cause a, a hindrance, but nothing that was a major repair. And, and then, and then I know that the COVID task force hears about the, the cleaning process, but the rest of this committee might want to hear about um, 
how that's going, the, the daily clean. How's the uh, daily clean going? Uh, we're doing a lot better. We have a good team in place now. Uh, Rory Sweeney has been overseeing them. He's come up with a nice process of how they deliver the buses from uh, the bus drivers coming in and parking at the lot to how they come through, get fueled, get cleaned, get pushed out, get wiped down. Um, if you've ever seen uh, uh, mirrors or how they operate at Disney, it's much, much of that aspect. It's been going really well. Um, conditions of the buses overall have come up quite a bit. Um, you know, we've got the bargers out there, so it's been doing really well. Okay. So any other questions for Mr. Gagnon? Let, let, me, let me just ask, along those, uh, along those lines, uh, I'm just wondering about the masking situation, or how is that going along with the passioners? Uh, you having any trouble? Uh, most people bringing out own masks. Do we have any more masks? Because the pandemic is still in full force, and I'm just wondering about that. How is the mask situation with passengers on our buses and with our employees going? Uh, I, I, so one more time, John. How is the mask uh, passengers and employees complying oh. with the mask policies adopted? Oh, um, so just like you read in the news, there's always a person here or there that um, doesn't want to comply. Um, our drivers are doing excellent with it. They're responding excellent to it. Um, educating the public has gone really excellent. I haven't seen a report um, that we've had an issue with that in quite some time. Um, so I, I think it's just because of the new norm and we haven't really seen a lot of it. Um, definitely at first there was more and uh, definitely takes off now. Any other questions? Thank okay. you. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Okay. Like the, um, when the buses would pull up and they used to have somebody, I have been on the bus now about a week or so. They still have a guy getting on there cleaning the seats off, you know, once we get up into the uh, terminal. Um, do we still have the utility worker from 12 to 3 at Common Central cleaning the buses? Uh huh, yes. Corey? Uh, did you have a guy? Well, you know, I'd have to double check with Lori and get back to her on that one. Um, I, I haven't. That's what I'm I asking. And Ms. Gleason, that, that is a contractual requirement that we have a utility worker at Common Central from 12 to 3 to okay. keep the buses right. clean. So. Okay, thank you. That's good. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. And we'll move on to the um, next item, which is the ridership report. John, are you are Eric? Yes, uh, Eric, are you on the line to get the ridership report? Yes, I'm here. Um, thank you to the members of the board. Uh, just quickly, just taking a look at an overview from, uh, I guess, June, uh, well, April, May, and June. Uh, in April, we were at 97,000 uh, riders. Uh, May, uh, around 86,000 riders. And June, uh, now we're at uh, 59,000 riders. Uh, and I guess, the, you know, it kind of looks up and down, but I guess to put it into a little perspective about, you know, how we have responded to COVID, and, uh, or at least the public response. Um, and April, we were at 124, but well, we were down 97, let, let, let me start back over. We were down 97,000 um, riders in April and down 86 riders, uh, 86,000 riders in May and 59,000 riders in June. Um, and so to date, to put that into perspective, uh, we are more so looking at a 12.9% increase from April to May and a 5% increase from May to June. So we are seeing, seeing some type of increase at this point in time. Um, and I'm guessing as we started to, uh, start to go towards the winter months or more, more so towards the fall, we'll see something pick up, uh, especially with uh, USC um, uh, announcing that they will be resuming classes as normal. Um, and so this should see, we should see significant changes in our uh, ridership uh, with, I guess, higher density. Also, um, just highlighting uh, Route 801, we saw a huge uh, drop in ridership as well. Uh, I credit um, the, this change um, with it, it due to possibly employment or uh, store 
operation hours within a harvesting area. Um, and uh, I believe that we, are, we may start to see some of those trends um, uh, start to increase, of course, um, when we start to look at months like July and um, August going forward. Um, but that's because a lot of things were changing and how they wanted to go about operations, whether it was social distancing guidelines um, or whatever other parameters they had to put in place. But um, I guess one of the connecting routes like 83L, uh, they saw more of an increase, and that's when we can look at uh, the location that A3L uh, covers, which is uh, Park Ridge um, Hospital. Um, so that could be credited to that as uh, that having access to different amenities that people may have uh, more interest in uh, in essential locations. So uh, we also, um, I guess, taking a look at Soda Cap One. I'm just going down the list of um, different things that I. That, that stood out to me, but as we started to look at Soda Cap 1, uh, weekday, Saturday, and Sunday, we saw an increase. Um, riders, uh, riders should have been all of those, uh, uh, all of those uh, service days, and um, I'm believing that, of course, we're starting to see um, a lot of people, um, and this trend is continuing to this day, uh, but we're seeing a lot of people um, become more brave in the downtown corridor, uh, just being able to get uh, from one place to another, and you know, during these uh, hot summer months. So um, as of right now, I think the most important aspect to look at is probably our coming to the market, um, Some at least some of those services that we know that are more essential than, it, than they ever have been. Um, as of right now, Uber is not functioning. Um, uh, I, from my understanding, I believe it's joining the program. Uber is still standing there right now. Okay, let's go ahead. Yep, yep, I, I missed that. You okay. said Uber is not. Uber is functioning. We just didn't have anybody use the Uber program. It's Uber's functioning, but they hadn't used it. Yeah, they used okay. Lyft instead. Oh, more Lyft. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we're seeing more of a response from Lyft, um, definitely. But we are seeing a, I guess you can call it a, a, a consistency of a service within the last, well, from April all the way to June. Um, in April, we've got 243 May. Uh, 258 in June, we were at 215, so it was like an average of 230, uh, 238 uh, users um, per month. Uh, and I, I think this is showing to some of the services that we are providing. We try to encourage our customer service reps. Um, anytime we are having any issues, someone getting access to uh, any location, we want to offer some of these amenities, and this is just one of those. And I think it's pretty telling uh, some of the services that we, we are providing and how well it's working. Any questions for Eric? I I I just want to say I'm I'm listening to these numbers, uh, but uh, are we are we really trying to grow our ridership now, or are we just letting it go uh, as it as it comes? What I'm saying is that under these circumstances, uh, it sounds like we are trying to get more people to ride the buses, but uh, but I'm not really sure if, if we're really trying to do that or that's just the way it sounds to me and uh, because i guess i'm, I'm, I'm kind of wondering why would we try to grow go, go ahead Ms. Go ahead. to answer your question uh, we're, we're not trying to grow our ridership right now we're still promoting transit as essential travel only um, uh -huh. is there emergency orders in place is that sort of thing since the, state, since the governor still has a state of emergency order, we don't necessarily want to create um, conditions or situations that our that will put our riders or our employees in danger. So, uh, no, we're not promoting ridership growth. However, we are promoting ridership di uh, diversity. And when I say that, we're wanting people to use our various mobility programs to get to wherever they need to get to safely. So when we mention Lyft and Uber, for instance, we want people to use that program to go to the grocery store. Um, for nighttime transportation, we want people to use Lyft and Uber. Uh, we want people who need to go to employment or they need to access social service to use our regular fixed route or our paratransit program or even our, our bike program but, or, or, um, or our van pool program, which you're going to hear about next. But beyond that, at this time, we're not growing uh, or actively trying to promote people to ride the transit system until we nope. can determine it's appropriate and safe to start growing ridership again. 
So that's what I think. If I just may follow up on John's statement, the data that we have, we're using it as a monitoring tool. Um, to try to see what trends are we seeing from uh, the response from our, our, our community. Uh, equally, we have uh, passenger counters on each of our buses, and before um, COVID-19, we were using those counters to, uh, to I guess, to take a look at ridership and uh, figure out which buses are uh, doing better than others, and we were just more so concerned on, you know, trying to change the routes to be more effective uh, for our customers. But in this case, we're using our um, passenger counters and uh, to, I guess, draw more awareness on how often our buses are filled to capacity. Do we need to provide more buses uh, out, um, I guess, in our fleet to make sure that we're keeping our passengers safe and bus drivers are feeling comfortable as well? Okay. okay. Well, one more follow, one more follow-up question. Under under the current conditions that uh, really have existed since when back in March. Do you think any uh, data that we are gathering is valid in terms of uh, where I heard you say something about uh, those routes that are uh, most productive and that kind of thing, but do you think anything we're gathering is valid in terms of helping us decide which routes are valid, I mean, uh, 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 are productive and which ones are not? Uh, that's what I'm asking. I'll, I'll yeah. take this question, uh, Mr. Lee. Uh, yes, I believe the data is valid to reflect what is happening post-COVID, meaning uh, many businesses have reduced their hours, which is causing people to uh, go to work at different times. Schools and uh, several offices, governmental offices, have not formally opened, and they've changed their uh, environment on how they're going to move into the future. So as we notice month after month with ridership slowly growing, it's growing because businesses or organizations are starting to adapt into this uh, new lifestyle that we have. So okay. the services that we had pre-COVID, I'll tell you, it's not appropriate to run today. Um, but the data that we're getting post-COVID is helping us understand what would be appropriate for the upcoming year. Does, does that make sense? And it was part of the question, too. Um, yeah. We're doing the automatic counts now with the fare boxes, and he was asking about validity of data. Yeah, we, had we, we have uh, automatic passenger counters on eight buses. On eight? And then we're doing passenger counts on our fare boxes through the bus operator. Okay. Um, the goal is by December, all 88 buses in the fleet will have automatic passenger counters, which will take that responsibility off of the bus operator from having to do those manual counts. And uh, per FTA requirements, we'll have to have those certified before we can use that as the official method of counting. And we're, we're and our contractor installing the system is working on that. So we just John, I guess, that. This, this, this is a final question for me, final question, Madam Chair. Look, yeah. um, what, I'm asking, what I'm asking is that under these conditions, can we determine with any certainty whether uh, a route is productive, underproductive, overproductive, uh, 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 you know, a need to be changed under these conditions, uh, uh, that's what I'm asking. Yes, yes, we can, because we're comparing the trends of the last uh, three months compared to the same period in the previous fiscal year. Okay. Does that take care of the questions then on ridership? Yeah. yeah. Right. I, I guess we'll, that's, that's good. So Go then we'll and and you. We'll be talking about the proposed services later on in the agenda, so we'll we'll probably come back to that again. Um, all right, so um, we're on the item nine now, nine A. Not yet. I have. Um, oh, okay. I also have our van tool contractor, oh, okay. uh, DJ, to give an update on the ridership of the van tool program. All right. DJ, are you on the line? I am, John. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Fantastic. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to share my screen. 
Um, if you are on a computer, you will be able to uh, to look at our screen. If not, uh, you can uh, get the presentation from uh, Mr. John. Um, I've emailed let's start. that to the entire committee. OK, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, so thank you, John, and the service members for having us today to talk about our partnership with the Comets uh, Vample program. Uh, first and foremost, hope everybody is safe and healthy during this time. Um, but uh, my name CJ, is CJ Asmus. Um, I am the sales executive and account manager here with Commute with Enterprise. Um, so I do cover the Midlands. And uh, we also have Dion joining us from our corporate offices in St. Louis. Um, Dion will speak on a little higher level about our program financials. Um, so we're going to talk about, uh, you know, first going to speak about the metrics of the Vample program, our environmental impact, and then we'll close it out with the uh, financials of our Vample program and partnership. Um, so our program metrics to start off with in physical, physical year 20, um, we averaged um, three Vamples for the physical year. Um, we actually ended the uh, physical year at um, 11 Vamples on the road. Um, the past six months, we have seen a growth in our service and partnership. Um, from ending the physical year at the 11 Vamples, we are um, estimating a um, return for funding for the Comet um, above $44,000. So our environmental impact with our Vample program um, in physical year 20, we reduced uh, um, 200,032 commuter miles. Uh, we reduced over 4,000 trips to and from work. And we also reduced um, 179,000 pounds of CO2. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and kick it over to Dion to talk about the financials. Yeah, and maybe, uh, CJ, thanks. Um, if you can maybe just go back a couple slides too, um, just to kind of put things in perspective. So the, you know, as CJ said, we, you know, this, this program has just really started to ramp up in fiscal year 20. Um, you know, it takes a while to get van pool programs off the road because just because of the nature of them and get it, having to get multiple stakeholders involved. Um, but CJ and the, the local team have done a great job really starting to grab some traction towards the end of fiscal year 20. And so while we were at an average of three for the fiscal year, that really ramped up towards the end. And we're continuing to see that momentum um, even in the, in the face of the pandemic and what's going on now. Um, many essential workers that, that don't have other um, ways to get to work or looking for safer options to um, to get out of SOV transportation during this time are, are looking towards van pools because it really does provide that a little bit more of that controlled environment where you're with a close knit group of coworkers that you that you're with on a daily basis anyway. Um, and so just to give a little bit of perspective here on some of the passenger miles, so about 300,000 passenger miles um, in the program for the year. That's really loaded at the back end of that fiscal year. And we project that that's going to be more in the more in the range of 1.5, 1.6 million passenger miles um, in fiscal year 21. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about a little bit more about what our projections are for that fiscal year as, as we get further on along the line here. But you know, talking about it in terms of passenger miles versus the overall um, service provided by the Comet. Um, by the end of fiscal year 21, I think in that fiscal year, we'll be somewhere in the range of 15 to 20 percent of the total passenger miles um, in service provided by Comet. So a, a small but very impactful program from that perspective. So CJ, I go ahead and flip forward a couple of slides here. Um, so we'll look at the program financials a couple of different ways because of the um, the way that the impulse um, generate funding from a formula fund perspective, um, we tend to look at it, break it down on a on an average van pool per van pool per month basis. And while across fiscal year 20, the total numbers are are relatively small. Um, the, a per van pool basis basis, it's uh, it's representative of what we can expect to see going forward. So that estimated monthly funding return per per van pool, that's a that's a per van pool per month funding generation based on the average vehicle revenues, revenue miles, passenger miles, and operating expense of the program. 
Um, it's right around twelve hundred and fifty dollars a month per van pool, um, which is it's it's right around in the ballpark of what we would expect to see um, in a urbanized area of this size. Um, like CJ said, the total funding generation for the year was relatively small, just under fifty thousand dollars, really because we we only had um, van pools operating in the latter um, part of the fiscal year, and then that annual net funding return after agency subsidy. That's um, that's the the net of that f um, estimated funding return, less the um, per month van pool subsidy Comet pays to reduce the cost of the riders. Um, so good news is that you know net of net of that subsidy, while it's a small number, the program was still in the black from the funding perspective. So TJ, next slide, please. So just another another kind of a way to look at the uh, cost of the program and the efficiency of the program from a, from a financial perspective. Um, the total uh, program cost up on top, and that's really the total um, in van pool subsidies that the company provided. I'm sorry, what was that? No, no, keep going. Go ahead. Um, that that total up top number is very small again because we only really had vans in the program the last couple of months of the fiscal year, but that represents the monthly van pool subsidy that the comet provides to those van pools to qualify for the program. Um, to put things in perspective, I think that um, for this year it was roughly 0.08% of the overall operating budget for the comet versus I think it ended up being right around three and a half percent of passenger miles traveled so pretty um pretty significant return even though the numbers are very small we, should, we would expect the same, same ratios carry forward into fiscal year 21 and then on a, a couple other metrics just to look at the efficiency of the program in terms of the use of comets dollars um, in terms of operating expense per passenger mile traveled um, for fiscal year 20 um, we saw a um, a cost from an operating expense perspective per passenger mile of nine cents per passenger mile traveled. Um, that's compared to just over two bucks to, uh, per passenger mile on the on the bus system. Um, we know the bus buses, you know, vary dramatically based on the the service area and what have you. From a van pool perspective, that nine cents per passenger mile is right in the ballpark of what we typically see anywhere from eight cents to twelve cents per mile in our programs. And then from a fare box recovery perspective, um, again, we, we typically see anywhere from 80 to 120% fare box recovery um, from an operating expense perspective on the pool programs, and we're, we're right in line there here. So from an efficiency perspective in terms of impact and service provided per, uh, per dollar expended by the Comet, um, it's, a, it's a highly efficient program from that perspective. And then CJ, next slide. Okay, so this is this just shows um, the progression from fiscal year 19 when we had just launched the program um, into fiscal year 20, and then what our projection is for fiscal year 21. Um, we only had a single van pool in the program in fiscal year 19 when it launched. Um, as, you can, um, as you can see there, the, the program is just getting started. I mean, the numbers are so small, it's hard to really look at them. Um, but in fiscal year 20, we started to gain traction at the latter part of the fiscal year. And by the end of the fiscal year, we had, we had those 11 vans on the road, um, an average of three across the year. Um, our average ridership there per trip was about four and a half riders. Um, average revenue miles um, per van pool per month was about 1,800. And then about 8,300 8, passenger miles per month. Um, and then from an operating cost perspective, about $766 per van pool per month. Um, and then in terms of you play that out over onto the right hand side, based on those um, metrics, those were the formula dollars generated and then the annual net formula funds um, net of the agency subsidy, the comet subsidy provided to those band pools. So you can see there's that 44,000 and the 29,000 that we talked about for fiscal year 20. Now for fiscal year 21, we started the fiscal year um, in July with 11 vans on the road. We're continuing to see traction. I believe we have another one going out today or tomorrow. Um, CJ can jump in and, um, and update on that. And then we expect to see, we're being a little bit 
cautious in the growth projections just because of the current situation. But we are still seeing traction um, in Vanpool for many of the reasons I talked about earlier. And we do expect the program to grow conservatively to to is in in the range of, of 20 to 22 by fiscal year end, um, which would put us in an average of around 15 or 16 vans. So if you play that out um, over on the right hand side, that's where you see the um, the annual formula funds for f- generated for the program in fiscal year 21 should be more in the neighborhood of a quarter million dollars, and then net of the subsidy, the program should be in the black for the comet um, around 150 thousand dollars for the year. And I, I think. Um, for the purposes of today, with the, the, the time that we have, I think that that's as far as we'll go. I, I think we're I think we're going to be also prevent, presenting some of this information on the on the larger board meeting here in a couple of weeks, and we'll have some additional time for for details and um, questions and follow up. But um, John, I don't, I don't know if you want to open it up for any questions that that folks may have based on what we've talked about so far today. So um, ultimately, uh, committee members, the Vanpool program is a key contributor to getting more federal funds to support our overall transit operations, and we're anticipating close to 250,000 this fiscal year of additional federal funding because of running this Vanpool program, which is taking um, our riders from uh, various locations in the service area to jobs. Let, let Mr. Chair, Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Burgess. Uh, uh, oh, go ahead. I'll wait for somebody asking a question. I, I, I was about to ask one, Ms. Burgess. Madam Chair? Yeah. Yeah, I asked Okay. Uh, I'm just wondering, that I'm almost ashamed to ask this, but are these vans um, wrapped in, in Comet logo? Yes. They are? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's all. You you know what would be really interesting to see is, um, and I'm sure our folks can do this with the numbers, is to see what the average cost to the rider for for using the van pool versus what the average cost would be for driving a private car versus what it would be to ride a um, an express bus if that were available. Uh, we have very few of those. CJ, do you have that information on the average cost to ride the van versus driving versus using an express bus? I, ha- I don't I have it. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, CJ. Um, I, 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 I was going to speak to it generally. Bus, but okay. I do have the average cost per rider. Correct. Average cost per rider. Yes, sir. So you do have that data available? Yes, uh, and I can uh, love to share that uh, with everybody um, if you would like. Yeah. That would be yeah. Yeah. Do, you, do you know? Do you know offhand? Because it, it's different for every program based on the based on the geography and, and average commute lengths. But do you, do you know just on average what the average cost per, per rider in the current in the program currently is? Just ballpark it. Yes, sir. Yeah. So. If you were to say um, on an average commute of 20 miles one way, and let's say they get into our uh, base minivan, the average cost would be around uh, $130. And uh, that is including their fuel. That's, so, that's per month. That's per month per rider. Correct. Okay. And the the average um, the average mileage being driven one way in the commutes tip, uh, currently in the program um, is about is, is about 40 plus miles. Um, if you saw the revenue miles per month per van pool, there was just over 1,800. Mm-hmm. That that equates to about a 42 mile round trip per, or sorry, one way trip per day, or 85 miles round trip per day. Um, so typically, um, when you know when comparing to the cost of driving their their own vehicle. Um, they're saving several hundred dollars a month on those long distance commutes. Um, it's hard to compare it to the bus to the to um, the cost of an express route um, because there's not there's typically not public transit service to compare to um, right. the distance or the geography or the surprisingly long long commute. That, that surprises me that it would be on average over 40 miles. Yeah, I, in. That that's about in line with with vanpool programs around the country. Um, 
we, you know, we we operate we operate over seventy of these um, partnership programs around the country with with transit agencies, and the average around the country is right about fifty miles one way uh, per commute. We do have van pools that go as as short as fifteen miles, and van pools that go as long as a hundred plus miles one way. But the average falls right around that fifty mile mark. Okay. All right. Well, uh, that's. Very interesting information. Thank you for your report. I'm not going to prolong this because I know we have other items on the agenda, but but thank you very much. Okay. We're, thank you. We're now, now we're moving to the um, passenger amenities program update. Yes. Is Zane or Todd on the line? Yes. Uh, this is Zane. Todd is also on the line. Give an update um, on your report. Yes, uh, we have in in the past month we have um, we've gotten 13 approved SCDOT permits for new shelter sites. Um, the majority of those uh, being 16 foot bus shelters. Um, in addition to those, the, in addition to those 13, we also received the SCDOT permit for the improvements at the Hardin Taylor intersection, which includes uh, multiple bus shelters and some additional benches as well. Um, in, the, in the coming month, we are we're working on uh, the design of 15 more shelters and benches um, from the recent uh, list of new shelter stops that were given to us by the comment. Um, and in addition to that, um, the AOS has completed two shelter stops in the past month and is working on two or three additional ones. Barely here, yeah. Okay. If you could speak up a little bit, Zane, that would Yeah. Yes, the 13 you permits, this is in your written material, let's see, on page 40 is what he's reporting from. All right. Okay. Anything else? You got uh, I did not have any. I'm mad at you. Do not have anything else. Okay. Any questions for, for um, Zane? Yes. Uh, Purchase. I'd like to know when will the uh, shelter at Fifth Street and North Main be reinstalled? Do you have that on premise? Yes, they'll be installed on by Friday. Okay. Also, is this uh, represented from Davidson, Floyd? Um, AOS yes. installing the shelter. Uh, is this a representative from Davis and Floyd to contract all of our self? So are you asking whether um, the, the person reporting was from Davis and Floyd? Is that, are you asking if Zane is representing them? That's correct. Yes, that's, that's who he's representing. Isn't that accurate? Yes, that's correct. All right. Uh, can you speak it to how many shelters he, he installed last year? You have that number um, for last year, Zane? In the last year, I, I don't have that um, with a, with me right now, but we can uh, we can provide a that number for that. Can you do that? That would be great. Yeah. Can you send that yes. out to all board members? Thank you. All right. Anything else for, you, for, for Zane? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you for that report. And we'll move to the university service update. Yes, um, I'll give that update. Uh, we are working towards an implementation of Excuse me. running. Excuse me. Uh, is, uh, university update, I'm going to recuse myself, please. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay, Dan. Let's speak a little louder, though. Um, we are running. We are. We are planning for 14 routes to operate starting September 1. 
Um, we have the five Las Vegas buses here, and uh, they will, uh, they're being inspected by our ATP dev, wrapped with the Comet branding, and um, our ATP dev is doing the current hiring of staff to operate these shuttles, as well as a supervisor to work with the university on the oversight of these services. We are working on the marketing, um, getting bus stop signs installed, and we are working towards a September 1 start date. Um, and then we'll have some ridership numbers to report, hopefully, by the October meeting. Happy to answer any questions if there are any on the university service. Is that Tuesday, yes. September? Is that what you said? They're, yes. they're aiming to start service on September 1. Yes, Tuesday, September 1. That's correct. Okay, gotcha. Madam, Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Curtis. Yes, on the uh, USC, what, what would be our interest in ridership if we've been paid on the service? What, what are we using that calculation for? use that ridership calculation so we can get additional federal and state funding to support the Comet system. Isn't the they USB they, they be, uh, ride on that system. Oh, okay. In other words, we're going to be fully paid for the USC system and the federal will be additional monies. Is that correct? That is correct. University pays for their bus service, and we can count right. their passengers for more federal and, and state funding. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, well, John, will you um, walk us through 9C, the um, autumn 2020 service changes? Yes. And, uh, now, and so let me be sure I state what we're doing here. Is that the, what, you, what you'll be describing is the analysis of what would be necessary in terms of service changes to um, operate within the budget that we anticipate, John? Yes, that is correct. And so that this is just the first step in, of, of, of presenting what the staff analysis is of this, which then the, what our committee does is ask questions and, and get a good understanding and discuss what's presented. And from us, it goes, a recommendation would go to the board on having a public hearing on this, on this, on the plan that we put forward. And then, then that, so then the board would approve uh, um, having a public hearing, and then we come back to that data to look again to see whether there were modifications that we wanted to make before making another recommendation to the board. Is that, have I got the process right? That is exactly correct. Okay. So does everybody understand where we are now in this process? So this well, is a ma'am. this is a first look at what would be what the staff analysis um, <coughs> is looking as is, is asking us to look at. Yes. Madam Chair. Uh, package Leo on, on page fifty two. <coughs> yeah, yes. Let me let me look at that page number to be sure. That's right. Fifty two through sixty three. Okay, gotcha. Madam okay. Chair. Yes, yes, Mr. Chair. I would like to make a motion, if I can. What's that? That we that we table this discussion on changes until the board has a final look at it, because we're doing too too many things with one procedure. We're reducing ridership, reducing service, and then we're talking about how we're making money. So we, the full board probably need to look at this. Well, well, this, well this, what we what, what we're asking is what we're asking of the service. What's asked of the service committee at this point is to to do for us to take a first look at it and then make a recommendation to the board. Then the board will will take that first. We'll take a complete look at that. Um, at the, they they will have this information at their at their meeting, and then what they will decide. What the whole full board. What we will decide. That full board is whether. Uh, we want to take this forward to a public hearing, and so that, and so we, um, we're not. I mean, there's, what happens today is what the vetting process that the service committee is charged with by the board um, for any proposal that would of, of this nature. M M Madam Chair, 
Yeah. I hadn't finished yet, Cooks. Uh, Go ahead. I think all board members must remember that November is an election year. We still got the penny that's supporting us. And if we come with a reduction in service after reducing service already and adding a university in at the same time while we're going in the towns that we get one or two riders, that's not going to look good. Plus all the turmoil that's going on within the system. I think we, I, that's just my saying. But we need to take well, a look I, at I, 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 understand, I understand your, your concern about anything that we would do that would reflect the need to um, reduce service. But we, but what prompted this is that when we look at the budget that's available to us and the cost per hour for service in our contract, then we have a certain number of hours we can pay for with, within the budget. And so this is this is this proposal is to help us stay. Within, stay within our budget for service, and um, and and these are the best ideas and the best um, calculations that the staff has come up with. And so, I think we, I, I can't see how we can do anything other than be obligated uh, to look at see how, to see how we keep service within the budget. We can't just. Um, uh, Madam operate. Chair. Yes. All all I can say is staff told us for the past six months that we could do without $2.5 million from federal by running a free bus system. Now we're getting to, with the free bus system, all of a sudden it's decided we're going to lose money. You know, something's wrong with either the calculations or something that we have to go to the community and sell. Well, I, and, think, I, think, I think we'll have plenty of, of steps in this process, John, if, if we do, let's Look at the timeline. If we do this today to recommend, to make a recommendation out of whatever we come to agreement on in this package, to recommend to the board for a public, um, a public meeting, and then that goes to the board in September, and they decide if they say yes to a public, public um, hearing on this, and then that public hearing takes place in October. Correct. And then, in October, at the, and so at the board meeting in October, would we have data from the public hearing, or not until the November board meeting? You would have data from the you would have data from the public hearing in October because we, the public hearing would actually be held in September. Okay, so then so we have data from the public hearing in October, and then the board would look at what the what the public data said and make and make any kind of modifications in what the what's proposed. And, then, and so when, when are we looking at a final decision on this? November? November, correct. Okay, so we're looking at a final decision in November. I, I just want to add a, Mr. Burgess made a comment that uh, we're down 2.5 million and the numbers could possibly be confusing. It, this is not about this fiscal year. Um, we are fine this fiscal year. The reason why these changes need to be considered is the future years. We have, we have an influx of CARES funding that is covering our costs for this fiscal year. The university service is fully funded and requires no subsidy from the Commons. What's going to happen next fiscal year is sales tax revenue on the penny is down by $2 million because no people aren't spending. Um, federal funds um, are going to be more likely around the same amount. Fair revenue is going to be down because ridership is down. So I'm trying to position the system for future fiscal sustainability by looking at removing services that are not productive now. Otherwise, if we wait too long, we're going to we're going to experience a deficit situation in the future years. And, and so uh, it may be. It they help us just to walk through what the actual proposals are because I think um, I don't I think it may sound more alarming than um, than it actually is in terms of uh, most of them are just modifications in some hours and some frequency. I mean we're not talking about taking away service to whole segments of the population. That's correct, Madam, Madam Chair. 
I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to digest this thing too. Now, if we if we if we go from uh, 150, 178, 178, 178,000 hours a year down to 100 and what to John about 158,000. Um, we're gonna we're gonna be chopping off quite a bit of a <clears throat> service somewhere. Well, that's, and, well, that's and, exactly what we have before us, is that we want to look at each one right, of those items and right, what right. is recommended. Yeah, yeah. So, so what, I'm, what I'm saying, before we, I would think before we took anything to a public hearing, to the board for a public hearing, that we would know exactly who's being impacted, where they're being impacted. We want to make sure that we can't get funds from somewhere uh, to, to, uh, to make this, you know, to keep our service hours at a at a at a higher level, uh, looks like we got the first thing we're cutting is service, and I don't know what we've done on contracts and 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 advertising and legal and all those kind of things, but it looks to me like we should consider cutting some of those things first, and then see if we have enough money to uh, to go ahead and fund our our uh, service at at a proper level. Because this, I'm gonna tell you, this is a drastic cut. Any way you look at it, you're going to have a whole lot of people upset. You well, are, well, really are. I think your question about examining how it impacts people, and that's, that's exactly what we're trying to get started on, is to take a look at item by item, and that, that's what okay. we have an opportunity to do, is to look at what the impact is then on, on the okay. over, overall. And then Thank you. when we hear, take it to public hearing, we'll hear from people in the community whether there's something that we've missed or that we miss, that they believe has a, a larger impact than we think. That's what they tell us when we take it. To right. Public. And then we okay. look at it again. And then we look at it again. But I, I'm, I'm reluctant. I'm, I'm more than reluctant to say let's don't do anything before we've even yeah. looked at what we have before us. So I think we are, right. I think we're obligated to look at the best work that the staff has done to calculate what we have we can manage to stay fiscally sound with the least impact on customer service. Yeah, thank thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, can you then get we'll started have on that. We have a chance to ask questions if, 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 as we go through this. I appreciate exactly, it. Thank you, exactly. Exactly. All right. Thank you. All right. So, John, we'll take it. All right. So, um, just one thing I want to note is um, um, Mrs. Leak made a comment. Did we look at everything? Yes, we, we've looked at everything. We've cut membership. We've cut contracts. We've cut any unnecessary things that the Commons should not be spending money on to make sure that we're being uh, fiscally prudent. The services that I'm going to be summarizing and I'm going to go in route order are services that are just not performing. People aren't riding them. They're, we're just running an empty bus, basically. So, um, uh, um, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, this, I, I had to excuse myself because I didn't didn't want to be on the, the line with the update. Right. And I'm I'm back on now. Um, oh, good, because we're just and you, beginning to walk through the proposed service changes. We're on page 56. Is that where you are, John? I'm going to go 54. at 54. At uh, 54. Okay. Did, did, we, did, did we vote on anything or? No, no, no. We're just we're just beginning to. Look. John's going to walk us through exactly what's in this proposal, so we can ask questions. All right. So we're on page 54 of your handout. You're going to start with Route Six. Yes. Okay. Route Six. Um, we're just recommending that we stay running a Saturday level of service seven days a week. And, and remind us that the, the major differences in the Saturday Chair. level of service are... Madam Chair. Hold on, minute, hold on just a minute. Let me get a clarifying question, then I'll get to you. The, the major okay. differences in a Saturday service are... So Saturday service is generally 80% uh, of a weekday service. So the service is less, is twenty percent less. In terms of the the hours that it's about the hours. Uh, hours of operation. That is correct. Okay. All right. What, so Mr. Burgess, you what, have a question? Go ahead. Yes. My question is 
with with the uh, nobody is uh, having any uh, meetings. There are no com- community meetings going on. So there's no input from the communities that we're supposed to be representing. That's why I say it's a moot question now to talk about cutting routes when nobody's riding the bus, because even though we're doing them free. I, I, and, I, and I keep hearing I, about I, counting I, it. How are they counting it? From the back door? Because nobody's doing it from the front. So how are these automatic cars working? So the community input is no, what we uh, that, that's what we are working toward is what do we put out for the community to respond to and to talk to us about and to raise questions about and to discuss. That's where we are in the process. We're just talking about what is it that we want to take to the community to hear from them all. That's all that we're doing today. But Ma- you, Madam Chair. You know, in the past, our community has been the transit center. My community ain't up at the transit center. So well, you can't go to the transit center with everybody outside and say, what y'all think of these changes? That ain't going to work. So what That's you're not, asking about is work. what will our process be for public input? And that, and we can talk about that. I mean, we can talk about that. that but that's not what's on the agenda today. But those are valid questions to be sure that we are doing an adequate job of getting the information to the community and providing a way for them to give us feedback. So, I mean, that part of the process, you're right, we have to be sure we're doing a good job of that. But right today, all that we're doing is trying to walk through what what we want to take to the board and say, this is what we want the board, the, the, we believe that the board should send out to get public input. We're not skipping that step at all. Uh, Madam, Madam, Madam Chair. Yes. Madam Chair Huggins. Mr. Huggins. Um, is, it, is it Colonel Leakes or, or Huggins? Yeah. It, it's you, I Huggins. It's Mr. Huggins, Huggins is what I heard. Right. Is it Huggins? Yes. Uh, is this uh, information only? Because we're not making a, a situation where we're going to vote on anything to make any changes, right? What? What? We, all, we, all we're doing is—is is, is this information only? I know we have the capacity. If there's some modification that the that the committee thinks is important to make before we take it to the board, we can we can we can take those um, recommendations. Madam Chair, I just I just. It's too much um, changes. We got to look at this in a different kind of way, and um, during this time, so I, I I would like to table this discussion to a certain degree, it's, especially if we're gonna have to vote. If we if we have to vote to move this to the, but if we information only, please let it be information only. All right. So so what you're asking is that um, if if we listen to this report today, what would we report today from John? Then you may want to wait to make a, make a decision on it. Is, but is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is information is, only. That you'd like to and hear this have, it, and it, then decide at, at the end of what we hear whether you're ready to take an action on it. I, I, I cannot take an action on this because this is a something that is very big, more than anything else, based on the conglomerates that we're trying to pull in. So. I just need us to be in the situation where we get this information, and if it has to be a special call meeting, as much as I don't like them, uh, please let it be a special call meeting. But at this well, time, well, it well, needs to be. Well, let me, let, me say, let me say this. Let me ask this be for clarification. Because if we put it on an agenda and we send out a packet, then, I mean, how do we get started if we never look at it? And the, I mean, we've got to look well, at I, it together before we can make decisions. We don't have to make well, We don't have to. I make, you, in other words, if we understand, if we walk through this with John and understand everything that's in the packet we got today, then at the end you may want, may want to say, I'm not ready to make a, to make a recommendation to the board. I mean, that's, that's, you can make a motion about that. But to, I don't want us to make a motion to table something that we haven't looked at. 
You see what I'm saying? Well, well, where, do we, I, yes, where, where do we ever get started? I mean, if well, we call well, another well, meeting, Madam, Madam we Chair, right where Madam, we are Madam, now. Madam Chair, that's that's my uh, that's that's my opinion. Is we need to uh, slow it down to a point where we have an opportunity just to really look at and and if, if um, Mr. Ando needs to go ahead and just uh, present this, that's fine. But I can tell you right up front from my point of view that we need to just give us a little bit of opportunity, a little bit of time, just to look at what how this is going to affect our passengers. That's, that's right. I, I, if, if, if you, if I understand what you're saying, that you, you don't, don't read, aren't ready to make a decision on this today, but would you... Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I, will I, 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 I really will want us to understand what's in this packet, and I think we do better understanding it if we have a chance to hear what the staff thought in, put in, in proposing this, have a, have a chance to ask questions, Personally, I will understand it a lot better than if I just take it home and read through it again one more time before another meeting. Um, yes, ma'am. So I, I would like to have that process of helping us understand what's in the packet today. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I support that. I will support that. That sound okay? Yes, ma'am. All right. So, Madam Chair, may I ask a question? Sure. Okay. Um, I'm just going to ask this question, and then that will give me the idea if I need to continue. As I stated, we have the we have the we're fine to run the service as it is right now mm -hmm. for this fiscal year. For this fiscal year, we are going to have problems next fiscal year. Mm -hmm. Does this committee want to start addressing that concern for next fiscal year now? Because it it takes a process to present review data, present recommendations, go through public hearing, and then the board to ultimately approve, and then go through the process of informing the public and making the change, which takes normally uh, three to six months to do. Or is the board fine, just status quo? If there's unproductive service, we just keep running unproductive service with, um, with the funding that we have. I, I, what I'm trying to avoid is a crisis from happening come next fiscal year because so, so we can we can either we can either begin to address it now and just start that Adam, process here. going, or we can just kick it down, kick, kick, kick the can down, down the road and hope it gets better. That's correct. What Madam you Chair, talking? what's your reaction from the from the uh, board? This Madam is, Chair, yeah, I'd like I'd like to say something because some of the board members weren't on board with this lengthy free service that we are given and the governor don't control the bus system. We keep hearing the governor this, the governor that. That's not the control of, of the uh, bus system. So this was a free thing that was put up with a lot of PR. So I'm, I'm amazed that how we coming up now with a shortfall when we wanted to do this free thing an entire year. So, you know, that needs to take some deep looking at. So I think finance you. needs to get involved before we even do any more this discussion because outsiders going to start looking at this. All right, so here's, here's, here's my understanding, and, and I can be corrected, but here's my understanding. The impact that the governor has had on the bus system this year has been to declare an emergency state. That's state. correct. And so that really obligated us to only run essential uh, services to get essential workers to the jobs that they were required to have. That's what we are obligated to do in, in an emergency. And, and the decision to go fair free was really a both a protection for drivers in terms of not handling money and passes and, and of having to deal with that additional exposure and was a, a help to the riders who were making very little money and their jobs were cut back on hours and they and they didn't have to pay bus fare. And correct. so all of that was covered by the CARES Act fund. That's why Madam we got Chair. federal money to cover that. Madam Chair. Yes. Madam Chair. We went yes. into the free ridership mode prior to the pandemic. 
So well, the two aren't we, related. But we, we did not. We did not go into we, we started free ride on March 23rd, 10 days after the governor did the state of emergency. All right, so did you get that information? We started free fair March 23rd that's, that's not correct. after the governor's emergency. Is that, that correct? That's not, I, was on, I was on vacation when free fair started. Uh, but but I think I think I think Madam Chair I think what the what what I'm hearing is that we first started discussing free fare back in September October of last year. Uh, we, and we, and, we and were, I, I we were discussing that we were but we never took action to do that. Right. Absolutely. We, 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 we were trying to get we were trying to get it established even before we knew whether we were going to have any CARES funds or not. We didn't even know the pandemic was coming. So what what it looks like? Uh, uh, are, are we going to end this free fair thing when we get these uh, 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 barriers installed? Because that the, the reason we went to free fair, from what I understand, it was that to protect the drivers from from passion of, uh, po possibly getting contaminated, and infected. So if we get these barriers installed, like we said, we've been trying to do for a long time. Maybe we could go back to collecting fares. And when you use that money collecting fares and cutting down on some of the, all the other contracts and other things that we have, maybe we'll be able to continue service at the level it is right now and not have to worry so much about next year. Maybe our budget well, will not. Well, well, uh, now let me, let, me, let, me, let me see if I can address a couple of things that I hear you saying. Certainly, that, that the, a decision was made to go back to free fare after the emergency. That is a board decision. That would be on the board agenda. That would, that would be discussed, that would be examined, and the board would decide whether that's the direction we're going in. That's not a predetermined decision, and, and that would have to, have to be decided then. Um, right. If, right. We, okay. if, we, if we go back to collecting fares, what has been our fare recovery ratio, John? Nine percent. Nine? Nine percent. So we're not talking about, I mean, we. So, so just keep that number in mind. I recognize we're down 30% in rise, so we're not going to get 9% in fair. So, but it, so, but, it, but, but, it, but all, of, all of those numbers would have to be what we would look at in a decision right, about right. whether to extend free fares. But really, free fares is not what's on our agenda today. Free fares, that's, a, that's something that would have to be on the board agenda, but it's not on the agenda today. What we are looking at now is, the question that John asked you is, is do, do, does the board, does the service committee today want us to not begin any process of looking at unproductive route as a way of preparing ourselves to be fiscally sound next fiscal year? Do we want to ignore unproductive service in, in, until later? That's really the basic question, because we just get this. All this does today is get us started thinking about what, how do we um, take into account cutting back on unproductive service to make us more fiscally sound. So, what is what is your pleasure? Do you um, are you do you are do you want to start the process by reviewing the material we have today? Or you don't want to do that. You want to not do that. Can we put this on hold, Liv? Well, I mean, we can we can put it on hold. We we can wait and say. Can we get some more, you know, data on information and stuff. Well, we can. That's what we was was were to be. That was what was on the agenda today. This is put for us to get this information and get ask our questions and get and get a better understanding of what's involved. Now we can say, we don't want to do that today, we want to do it next month. I mean, we can say that. Or we just keep running unproductive service. Or, but, 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 but what we're trying, what, that's, but, well, what we're doing is saying as the service committee is that we would rather not look at what's unproductive now and make any decisions. We'd rather postpone those decisions. Is that what we're saying? Is it that bad of ridership or yes. I just, I, I just want yes. to know. Yes, we're, we're running we're running empty buses late in the evening 
that people are not writing and you, you have you have people that are complaining why are we running empty service and so, so and so the alternative is we is if we if we said all right on this on this route we're not getting any riders after a certain hour okay. and, and, and so just and just take those hours those later hours out and then if there are people i mean that's why we have the agreement with uber and lyft that's correct and if there are people who you know are the exception and they need to, be able to get back they can take they can take that as an alternative okay. but for right now what we're looking at is that we're just continuing to run some of the buses certain hours that they're not nobody using right uh, madam chair yes just you know, and I have to keep saying this over and over. When you don't know the community, you always recommend changes that impact the communities you don't visit. If you take late rider the bus out of these neighborhoods late in the evening, you you disconnect the city of Columbia from itself. Now you have empty buses riding through the city of Columbia and everywhere else all day long, but when we ever think about cutting hours, we think about late in the evening. We don't, we don't think about these are the voters that wanted to try to connect their communities, and they want to do that after 6 o'clock in the evening. Well, now, but, I, I, so, but, so what you're saying uh, is that... I mean, sometimes you have to visit these communities and find out what's going on, and nobody seems to want to do that. You've got well, to get out of downtown sometime. Well, the best data that we have, I mean, what the best data that we have is who, what buses at what hours are people riding. Right. That's the best data that we have to work with. Now, if there's, if there's, a, if there's an unmet need in a community, that, but people are not riding the bus that's coming there now, I mean that that was that's another avenue of exploration. But all that we have to go on at this point is, where are we running buses in the communities at certain hours that nobody is riding? Ma Madam Chair. Yes. Ma Madam, uh, yes. my my question: Do do we have that information? And was this information was this data gathered before the pandemic or after the pandemic? That's what I, when I was talking about validity. Uh, I don't think we can can decide whether a bus is empty right now because you know it's supposed to be empty with the pandemic going on. With, with the data that we gathered, with was together before the epide uh, epidemic or after a pandemic or before the pandemic. Both. John, tell, John. Tell, us, tell us what the data was that. gathered. Both, both before both. pandemic both. and after a pandemic. Yes. Okay. So, so, so. Uh, so the buses so that these are buses, now, so these buses, but like for instance, the Route Six. Uh, I'm yeah. gonna use that as an example. Route Six runs until eight o'clock. We're asking to chop off one hour of Route Six because that last trip on Route Six has been continuously empty for more than a year. Wow. And, okay. and, so, the, okay. and so that one little piece would be just to say one hour. One hour difference in that round. But, but that's where I beg. Now, John can come up with that data that during the time he was collecting data, nobody rode that bus from, say, from 5 to 6 o'clock, one hour. But you can go back during the day between 12 and 4, and it may be two or three hours nobody ride the bus. No, you know what I'm saying? Are, you, when you put the bus early and you can see empty buses, all over town, all day long, you are disconnecting neighborhoods in the city of Columbia. So, the two, two if points. If you live that. here, you would well, understand that. Uh, but if you what don't, I, what, I live, what, 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 Mr. Burgess, I live off of the Route 6, and I ride the Route 6, so sometimes I'm the only one on that last Route 6. That's one. Two, we're not disconnecting neighbors because we do look at all the trips all day long, and our system is at its highest performance between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. So cutting trips in the middle of the day would be detrimental to our ridership. Three, we, we have a Lyft and Uber program that 
runs from 9 p.m. until 3 a.m. I'm proposing that we start that at 8 p.m. and run it until 6 in the morning, and people can use the Uber Lyft program, which is people are doing today. For people that don't have a smartphone or don't have the ability to use Uber and Lyft, we have Dart service that's available to them that will do exactly what Uber and Lyft does during that same period. So all we're doing is we're, we're taking away unproductive bus service and we're shifting it to something that will be more productive and actually match what the community is looking for without taking away things from the community. Mm -hmm. if, if that approach is not, is not appropriate, we can keep running status quo, but I'm just advising this committee that status quo is costing you money that is, that is wasteful because we're just running empty service that's not meeting the needs of the community. And, and, and just from my own perspective, I mean, I want us to be good stewards of the, of the resources that we have. So I, I believe that that makes it, that compels us to say, what is the wisest use of that money? And how, how can we eliminate things that don't harm people in the elimination? And, I, I, and so it's important, it's important to me that we have a backup system like the Uber and Lyft so that we don't leave people stranded. But, I mean, if, we, if, if in fact we find, I mean, we look at that data. And if, we, if in fact we found that people along Route 6, that um, 10 people... 15 people every night are using Uber and Lyft, then we'd have to look again and say, maybe we ought to be extending that hour of service because we're getting that kind of demand from people who need a, need a ride there. That doesn't tie our hands to not do that. And we'll have to continue to be vigilant on that data to tell us if there's a, a place where we are, we are um, that gives us any indication that there's a, um, uh, a swell of need that we and, and of demand that we uh, that we need to address. M Madam, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, may I may I ask one question? I'm just wondering where are we having the most growth with the Uber, uh, uh, Uber and Lyft? Uh, what what is is there any specific parts of town or the county or or what? Because yes. I'm, I'm reason I'm asking uh, that. Where we, I'm the, reason, where we have the most reason, growth. In the Uber and Lyft program, based on the data we get from Uber and Lyft, is in the downtown Columbia area. When people mm -hmm. are going home, like from Forest Drive Walmart, after the last bus that's left at 10, at 10 o'clock, uh, these people are getting off at 11 o'clock or midnight, trying to get home okay. to housing in the downtown Columbia area. That's where okay. we see a lot of the ridership growth on Uber well, and Lyft um, that night. I guess, and we also have I guess, people that are using Uber and Lyft at night uh, coming home from Prisma Health, Richland. We see a lot of docks in that area going to um, destinations along the 101 route, such as Colonial okay. Drive, North Main. That's where we're okay. seeing the Uber Lyft demand. Yeah. I, I, I kind of forgotten the service. Is it, do we have service areas for Uber and Lyft? Because I'm wondering down my way or uh, down in East Over, if I were to call Uber or Lyft, uh, could I get that service? Yes. The uh, entire common I, service area is part of the Uber and Lyft program at night. So if you need a you ride from your house to to my house, you're, you're able mm -hmm. to get an Uber car, and we'll pay the first $5 of that trip anytime between 9 p.m. and 3 a.m., seven days a week. And is that true for, for, for Eastover or somewhere like that, too? And then yes. what kind it's of true for East? It's true for Eastover, Gaston, Hopkins, West Columbia, Springdale, Cape, downtown Columbia, Forest Acres. Madam, Madam Chair. Anywhere we have common service. All right, hold on a Okay. I, I, I heard Mr. Ferguson, but was that somebody yes. before him? I would just like to uh, motion that we send this to the board for a discussion and then let the board make a recommendation back to the service committee because I'm hearing about people riding downtown or people riding 101. Those are the areas that we cut out buses before. But we, we were putting the Uber in the area that we did cut service. But I think it's bad to cut service during the election year. 
So everybody ought to be able to look at that. All right, so let me so see if I understand your motion, Mr. Burgess. What you would like, what you would like to move that we take the question that that we, that was that was raised about this information to the board to give us direction to say, do we want to start the ball moving on a plan to make us fiscally sound for next year, or do we want to wait? If that's the question you want us to take to the board. Now, my motion is that we send this to the board for a referral back to the service committee. The board should be on board with all these changes because some of them are going to have to answer to the changes. Well, well we, I mean, I, an election year. Here's, here's the thing. I mean, at taking, taking the question to the board of whether they would prefer that we not address unproductive routes and and at this point in time, or that we start the process for addressing un, 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 um, it, productive routes at this time, that's a, I think that's an appropriate question to the board. Madam Chair, when it goes to the board, no, no, those no. other financial issues can be discussed at the board, too. And that will be done when it comes back to the board. So I'm just I, saying not, well, not, not get rid of it. Just have the, the board refer to us rather than the service to the board because it doesn't, you, you don't hinder any time frame. You just send it to the board and let the board discuss this reduction in service. So, so you think the board is going to prefer that, I mean, if we are part of the board, it's going to prefer going down this list item by item for the first time at the board meetings rather than in a service committee meeting? Uh, the, 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 this thing is service changes and a reduction in service, and the board need to look at that before that get out. Then the board has the answer to it. Because as soon as we get out, we cut in service, which has been done for the past two years. All we've done is cut service in the city of Columbia and Richland County. Well, That's I can we, tell you that if, if, the board gets, if the board gets out there. that we're cutting service, but by putting this on the on the service agenda, that's misinformation because that's right. not that's, that's not we have not made any decision to do that. All we've discussed in this meeting is cutting service. Well, if if, if it if it's if it's more important to you to have empty buses continue to run than to tackle this. I mean, it's not easy work, but it's the, that it's preferable to you to have us run empty buses than to tackle our decision. We, we can decide to do that. The only thing I'm concerned about is the Richmond County taxpayer that voted for the penny and have representatives on the board that represent them should have a fair shake in this discussion rather than you sit at a computer and say, ooh, I'm going to cut this, and I'm going to cut that, and the community has no input. Well, do you, how, do you, how, do you think, how do you think the voter who voted for the penny tax feels about spending the penny to run an empty bus? How do you think they feel about that? Well, they, they'll prove that point at the next election that it won't pass again, but we should be good stewards of the penny now. Well I think that I think if we are not I think if we are not good stewards and we don't make the hard decisions to do the things that are uh, make sense to do to spend the penny wisely, I think we make ourselves more vulnerable. Is my motion still on the table? Well, would you restate your motion please? That we send the request for August service changes to the uh, board. For discussion and referral. What was your motion, Mr. Burgess? That we send these August changes to the board for discussion and referral. That we send the packet that we received in the service committee to the board for discussion and referral. And referral. Is that, is that motion? All right. Is that something? 
And we have a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay, you ready to vote? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm voting no. Um, Mr. Huggins? He dropped on um, Mr. Burgess? Yes. Ms. Gleaton? Yes. And those are the only... Yeah, those are your voting, so yeah. Those are the only voting members here? Yep. So, um, so the motion carries by two to one, a vote of two to one. And to, to put this, to ask this be put on the agenda for the board meeting. Is that correct? Yeah, yes. So my, we understand it goes on the board. It'll go to the board, and the board will then vote to either take action or send it back to the service committee for the service committee to study to ultimately send it back to the board. Exactly. Yep. That is that is that what everybody is that what everybody's understanding is of what we've just done? Okay. All right. And we'll move to the next uh, item. Um, and that's a um, 9D special service contract with United Way. Yes, um, mem uh, Madam Chairman, woman, and members of the committee. Um, last year, we operated Route 7, the inclement weather shuttle, to take uh, passengers from Comet Central to the inclement weather center. The United Way would like to enter into another contract with us to do this service again for this fiscal year. And I am requesting a uh, recommendation to operate this service at $90.18 per hour. Um, and the United Way will reimburse us at a cost of $33,951. And happy to answer any questions if there are any. Are there any questions about this proposal? Okay, they're asking for our services. Is that what you're saying, John? I couldn't hardly hear you. Okay. Yes, they're asking for us to operate the shuttle between Comet Central and the Inclement Weather Center. And they will reimburse us at 100% like they did last year. And I believe the material in the packet indicates that this is, runs along regular routes. If anyone else wants to ride that bus on the, while it's running that shuttle, they, are, they, are, they can do that. They're welcome to ride, right? Exactly right. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. I said we need to take it. Don't pay us. All right, so you, you want to make a motion that we approve that this week? I'll make a motion that we approve that. All right, is there a second? second. Mr. Burgess, second. second. Any further discussion? And all in favor, I vote aye. Um, Mr. Burgess? Aye. Ms. Gleaton? Aye. Aye, and that passed. All right. Is there anything else to come before the committee? Uh, that is it, Madam Chairwoman. All right, does anyone else have anything that we need to? Bring to the committee at this point. Um, Do I Madam have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? I second. All, right. All in favor? Ms. Gleaton? Aye. Ms. Burgess? Uh, aye. And Madam Chair? Yes, and I vote aye. Congratulate you on your appointment. Thank you no. so much. <laughs> I can hardly stand how much fun I'm having. You did a good job today, dear. Thank you, Mr. Gleason. All right, you're adjourned. All right, y'all have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye.